Welcome to the Numinous Factor, the home of spiritual and metaphysical exploration through the guiding lights of Ronnie May James, medium, and Claudia Ruland, astrologer. Debate and discussion, observation and openness, stimulation and sensitivity to all matters pertaining to our soul. The Numinous Factor. Greetings, one and all, to The Numinous Factor. Our first segment on The Numinous Factor today is called Spirits, Talking About Spirits. This is where Ronnie and myself discuss a particular weekly topic relating to the spiritual and metaphysical realms. Today's topic, of course, being our debut episode, is who we are. And I'd like to introduce you to Ronnie Mae James. Well, hello. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, there's quite a bit I'd like to say about myself, which is not unusual. But as a medium, um, I was born with a particular skill, which I didn't realise was mediumship until I got to about 15 or 16. Having been brought up in a very pagan-centred uh, culture, um, we learnt a lot of... Um, different beliefs that are based around the land and the nature and very much about spiritual being and also I lived alongside gypsies that came through the village in the seasonal time you know fruit picking and um, so I learned a lot about their culture so in some ways I suppose I grew up with them and so uh, the mediumship just developed from there and I realized that when I got older that I actually could use it to help people and I think that's what's inspired me uh, like yourself Claudia to come and share the knowledge that we've got to Absolutely. help people and um, you know invite people at some point to ask us questions so hopefully we can answer them so mm -hmm. there's me the little old medium the little old you <laughs> my story is a little different but um, my interest with um, astrology and numerology started when I was quite young um, and discovering that I was uh, clairsentient, which is having a, um, a higher sixth sense, uh, very strong uh, sensitivity to vibrations around me as well. Certain experiences uh, that I had as a child sort of led me down a slightly different path, I think, mm. to um, where yeah. the world was expecting me to go. But... Um, starting to read books when I was quite young in relation to astrology and numerology and I discovered I had a certain natural niche for it and um, just in relation to interpretation and so forth I quite enjoyed it and, and um, over the years I've uh, been studying astrology but actually been doing it now for close to 30 years and um, quite often have people that I help when I cast their charts and so forth and Sometimes people just need a little bit of a direction and guidance as to where they're going in life. And yeah, you just, um, it does help and I enjoy it thoroughly. Yeah. Um, you know, I was just going to say most people don't really know what a medium means. It's definitely not a large, but a medium, <laughs> it's a medium, you know, we do see spirits from the other side. We see loved ones that are passed over. They yeah. might come and see me. They might give me their name, they might uh, want to communicate, and it might be just to tell their loved ones that they're all right, that everything's okay, yeah. that they're not in pain anymore, and life is a peach, really. Yeah. Um, so mediumship is more than just being a psychic, and it's more than just being a clairvoyant. Yeah. Can you remember your first experience when you, you first saw someone from the other side coming yeah, to say hello yeah I am um, at uh, primary school we um, uh, I had a very close friend Louisa at the time and uh, we went everywhere together we had little there were little villages that was uh, in Cornwall and it was along uh, the seaside and her village was probably about a mile past mine so it was quite an effort for little kids to walk to be way. with each other yeah <laughs> get their bikes or, you know, walk across the beach. And unfortunately, uh, Louisa developed leukaemia quite oh, early on okay. and subsequently passed away. Mm. And I used to say to my school teacher that she was here at school. And they'd say, no, I'm sorry, darling, she's not here. Oh, wow. But I would say, well, she is. She's sat right next to me. She's here and she's talking. And they'd say, 
look, you know, we, we know that you miss your friend, but, you know, she's passed away and she's not here. Mm. So after a while, I just learned to be quiet about it because Louise was there. Louisa was there. She used to play in the sandpit. And, um, wow. Yeah, as I got older, there were obviously subsequent uh, examples of that. And then I realised when I got to about 15 that people didn't see things the same way as I did. And particularly with a culture that reinforces the spiritual side of life, um, you suddenly realise when you hit the big city, like Plymouth, yep. which yep. you know is not, is not a city to us, Melbourne is, yep. um, you soon realise that you are very different and people yep. don't quite understand. And I think that's when you kind of question it too. Yeah. Did you ever do that? Uh, my experience with that was more, um, I lost my brother when I was, um, seven, he was five, he was run over by a truck in front of our home. And at the age of seven, you don't really understand where did he go? He's why, why isn't he coming home anymore? I did, and in mm. those days too, cause I grew up in, in Ontario and Canada in those days. So this is the mid sixties, um, small children under a certain age weren't actually allowed into the hospital period. So I remember having to sit out in the car and look up at the window, knowing which room he was in, but oh, I wasn't allowed to see him. So I never saw him hard. again. Yeah, he was, he was just gone. So it was very hard for me to understand where he had gone. And so it kind of shifted things for me emotionally because I was angry I was confused. Mm. I just went through this full range of emotions. And I remember just sitting up in my bed at night and just talking to him and just knowing he was there, if yeah. that makes any sense, yeah. even though I wasn't actually seeing it, but I just knew his presence was in the room with me. And I just said, you need to, because my, my parents were had just fallen apart. It was um, a terrible thing to lose a child. And it affected their relationship terribly. Mm. Um, and... I just kept saying, you need to let them know that you're okay. So time went by and, and the family kind of fell into this strange silence. And my, my older brother suffered the most because he blamed himself because he was supposed to be watching um, Tim that day when they were playing in the backyard. And dad came down to breakfast one morning. Now, up to this stage, it had become a bit routine where the breakfasts were quiet. Mm. And this particular morning, dad came downstairs. This is after me asking Tim to just give us a sign let us know you're okay dad sat at the breakfast and he he looked different he had this big smile on his face and my mom said oh you've slept well and he said yeah I actually had quite an extraordinary dream last night and she said well what did you dream she said well he said I dreamt about um about Tim what did you dream and he said well we were playing catch in the in the park like we used to and um after a while Tim caught the ball but then instead of throwing it back he walked up to me and he took my hand and he put the the ball in my hand and he said dad I'm okay you have to let me go and um my father kind of he got it he understood yeah and he said I just after that you know gave him a hug and then I just sort of watched him go off into the light and when he he said when I woke up I actually felt calm Hmm. and I felt at peace And my father was always a very skeptical person, but that was kind of a turning point for him in relation to opening up his mind yeah, and sort of accepting that there is something beyond this world where we exist in the physical yeah, and that Tim was just letting him know that he was okay. It's amazing, isn't it? In, um, you know, in our lifetime, you have to wait for a tragedy to happen before you begin to question. Well, I wouldn't say that everyone does it. But um, people don't really question it until there's a trauma of some sort. You know, you lose a child yeah. or you lose a parent. Or you become ill. Or, yeah, you yeah. know, become ill yourself. Um, but, you know, going back to my childhood, it was something that was very prevalent in part of the growing up. You know, if you said you saw something, they would just say, oh, did you? And what did you see? Mm. Rather unlike yours, where, you know, children weren't part of the... Uh, experience of death yeah Yeah. and it's still a very um, taboo subject isn't it you know it's not something that you celebrate whereas really we should yes um and there are cultures around the world that do yeah absolutely but uh you know um reinforcing the fact that there is life after death and you know people do come back spirits do come back to see you to tell you that they're all right they're okay Yeah. yeah i remember um when my mother died, I was still quite young. I was only 11. And she did actually appear 
in the room at the bottom of the bed. Remember, you thought we talked about the scenario of yeah. the grandma turning up. Yeah. Well, in my case, it was my mother, and um, she just waved to me. There was a smile, waved to me, and disappeared. Yep. And shortly after that, I learned that she had actually passed away. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, now this is where I want to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to introduce myself just briefly. Yeah. My name is Brody, and I'm the operator of the equipment (laughs) but my real job here from time to time is to play the alter ego of the listener i want to ask you a question that i think your listeners would ask at this Mm. stage yeah there was a time for both of you that you realized you had a gift Mm -hmm. yeah how did you come to terms no uh, first of all acknowledging that you had it and could and could quantify it Mm. And secondly, that you could live with it knowing that the public would not easily warm to the two exp- the, 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 the two gifts that you both had. Mm. Oh, that's a good question, Brody. Um, yeah, because there's, there's no one time where the, there is a light bulb moment where you think, oh, my God, that's it. But for me... Um, Probably because my parents died when I was so young. My dad died when I was nine. My mum died when I was 11. And I wanted to go into the nursing profession because I had this desire to give back for all the time that they'd given my mum, who'd been dying over quite a a long time of cancer. Um, That when I was nursing, I started to realise then that I I could see the soul. So when a you know, a patient passed away, the soul leaves the body 20 minutes normally before it dies, before the person passes away. And so that spirit, that soul, would actually have a conversation with me. Or I would know when that person was going to go. So it was, like, helpful for families to be able to say, I don't think they're going to last the night, where nobody can actually put their finger on it. Um, In one case, I actually had a friend who was told that he had brain cancer and would probably be given eight, nine months to live. I was able to tell him he only had six weeks and he died within six weeks. Wow. But being able to give that information to him was so helpful because he said, well, what am I going to do? I said, well, you're going to tell all the people that you really care about how much you love them. If you haven't told them that, do it. If there's things you want people to have, don't wait till you pass, give it to them. And talk, you know, share stories, share your history so that they can take that those stories to the you know the next generation and that's what he did so i suppose but did you find the gift frightening yes i did and there was a stage in my late teens when i i mentioned earlier that when i went to live in the city that there were people that didn't really get what i was saying and they thought i'd had too much to drink or i was a bit loopy and that's when I started questioning it. And I didn't, hadn't learned to switch it off. Uh, I couldn't control it. And it did feel that I was becoming unwell mentally. And then I started going to a spiritual church and they were able to say, no, what you can do is you can tell the spirits to leave you alone. Because I, I would be asleep at night and they'd pull my toe or they'd pull the covers off me because they wanted to talk to me. But I didn't realise I could actually say to them, could you please leave me alone? In fact, I probably didn't say it as quite as polite as that. <laughs> well, I can't say that on the podcast. But I'd ask Yes, them, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd say, you know, just leave me alone. I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. So I learned to switch it off. So, yeah. Did you have a... Was it frightening for you when you realised there was a power? Or there was this gift? With me, with, with clairsentience, it's a little different. It's just you would initially assume as a child when you first start feeling it, you just think everybody has the same ability. Um, but I learned as time went by that what what I was able to um, uh, feel or whatever was unusual. And as time went by, I started to learn how to use it to my advantage. And um, as you know, depending on circumstances, if I was uh, coming into a situation that was potentially dangerous, or if I was in the presence of someone that was not a very nice person my radar would go up and I would sense it straight away and I would know to to back away from that person or that situation yeah and um 
Yeah, just situations, many, many situations throughout my lifetime. It, the ability has guided me in the right direction. So it was never terrifying. It was something.